Welcome back to the Changemaker Podcast. I'm your host, Deke Copenhaver. Today, my guest is from Ireland, coming to us live from Ireland, Aidan McCullen. Aidan is a change consultant and works with organizations to improve how they collaborate and create the environment for change. He's a host and founder of the Global Innovation Show, which boasts Bill Gates as a listener and advocate and features on Ireland's national broadcaster, RTE, and the only English-speaking show in Finland's Business FM. He's an author, just an amazing guy, um, lectures at Trinity College. So I could just go on and on, but ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Aiden. Welcome to the Changemaker podcast, hosted by Deke Copenhaver. Deke is the author of The Changemaker, a Forbes publishing book that has reached number one on Amazon on multiple occasions and in multiple categories like management skills and total quality management. During this podcast, Deke interviews exceptional change-making leaders. Deke currently operates Copenhaver Consulting, where he helps local governments and other public organizations maximize their potential. He's also a sought-after public speaker. We hope that the change maker has an impact on you today and that you find takeaways that make you a better leader in your life. Now, here's Deke. <laughs> Deke, great to be with you. I, I feel bad with that intro with your voice. I was, I was telling Deke before... One thing we we do well in Ireland is whiskey and whiskey <laughs> <laughs> whiskey for your throat is supposed to be a great cure a hot whiskey. Yeah, well, I'm coming over to see you in June, so hopefully it'll be better by then. But uh, I just want to talk to you, Aiden. So you are a change consultant, and you've written a great book that I just read, "Undisruptible: A Mindset of Permanent Reinvention for Individuals, Organizations, and Life." But so you are a former professional rugby player. And I was thinking about that today. So life is about transitions, but transitions and change are never easy. I know, you know, I was 47 when I left the mayor's office. So it was a transition. But talk to me a little bit about and I think for professional athletes, that's never an easy pivot. But talk to me about your transition from being a professional athlete to doing what you're doing now. Yeah, so I, I'm very lucky, Deke. I'm so lucky in many ways. I see my life as I've had many lives already at a relatively young age. And one of those lives was the transformation or the reinvention after a sports career. But the one before that was actually to become a sports player because yeah. I was a very average athlete. I was that kid in school that was last picked. And my first transformation, if you will, was to become an athlete. And what that taught me, that experience, that early experience in my late teens, because I, I only started really playing rugby when I was 16. And six years later, I was playing for the national team. And 10 years later, like from the, the starting point, I was playing for the best clubs in Europe, which it was just when I look back on it, I go, that was great because <laughs> my starting point was so low. And yeah. that, that was the the great thing about that. And when you're in a career, and I think this is important for anybody out there who's struggling in their career, you, you don't see it that way. I All I saw was the things I didn't achieve and what yeah. if I played more and all these kind of things. But when you have the benefit of looking back, you can kind of go, I was so lucky to do that. When I look at kids now and their desire to become sports players and the efforts they put in, I go, wow, I was blessed to have that experience. So that that was the first transformation. But as you recognized, the second can be extremely disappointing and difficult. And as you know, in NFL, American football, many, many players struggle despite retiring on millions of dollars of salary, lose a lot of that wealth within a few years because they cling to the persona that they've developed. And that's one of the things that sports gives you is this feeling of you know you're in a bubble and everybody loves you and all this but yeah that's gonna end and i think that's a gift to be given that early that experience to go you're gonna this is gonna come to an end you gotta reinvent you gotta do the work before you need it and i talk about this consistently through the book build capability before you need it yeah because when you need it it's gonna be too late and i was lucky because at the last two years of my career i was injured and because I was injured, I started to explore new capabilities, new opportunities, etc. Well, you know, it's interesting because I learned from your book so much. 
And one of the things, as, as I say, it inspired me to get to work on my second book. But I started thinking about it. I had a ghostwriter for my first book, which it made it easy because I had written a, a monthly column on leadership for an organization called the Georgia Municipal Association for like four years. So I had the content, but he helped me just plug and play. But I thought about it. And I'm like, after reading your book, I'm like, he taught me how to write a book. So I just need to do the outline and then write around the outline. So I'm I'm getting so busy with so many other things. I've kind of slowed on the writing, but I'm nearly halfway through. And that was based on something I learned from your book. I'm like, wait a minute, I already know how to write a book because somebody taught me how to do it. Yeah, you, bu you build these capabilities and you don't even notice sometimes. And sometimes yeah. it's some effort you had in the past. Like Charles, your, your producer for your show, for example, will understand this one. So when I was playing pro sports, I started to try to build new skills. And I didn't, I didn't have any intention to be a producer, but I took a course in music production and this was you could see it as this isolated event but when i look back on it i go it's so beneficial now for me for my own show for editing i don't need to hand it to somebody to edit and i enjoy actually editing the shows i do myself because i learn again it's another yeah. pass at the learning and when i think about that i kind of go i i would have thought that was just this isolated event yeah. and the the flip side is sometimes when you try things they don't work out as planned and I talk about this, as you know, in the book, I say there's always assets in the ashes. So yeah. even when you think there's nothing there, there's something because even if it's like, well, I went out with somebody and they turned out to be a bit of a jackass, I, <laughs> I learned type of what type of person I like or not, as the case yeah. may be. And it, it's, it's almost I often think about it like pinball deek, where you're like, that didn't work out, go this way, that didn't work out, go this way. And equally, that door did open for me. It's the yeah. right door. So I think there's a lot of lot of lessons in that. You know, it's interesting. So I had a call-in radio show for about a year. And prior to doing it, they gave me no instruction whatsoever. So I didn't even know where to plug the headphones in. So doing live three hours a day call-in was the best preparation I could have for doing a podcast. Because it, it almost, I mean, when you're live without a net for three hours and you've got open phone lines, you learn in a hurry, but it makes it, it's like doing a 30, 40 minute podcast. It makes it seem easy to a degree, but having that experience, I think made me better at podcasting. Yeah. And it's like, there's, um, there's different types of learning, like there's implicit learning, which is stuff you just know how to do implicitly and then explicit learning. And I often think about even any kind of transformation efforts in an organization, 75% of them fail. And I think they fail for the same reason that New Year's resolutions fail. And that they're up something like 80, 90%. And it's because you can't change what people do until you change how they think. Yes. And I, what you said there is really important is you got to try stuff. If yes. you don't try it and you don't find out how to actually do it other than reading the theory about how to do it, you're not going to build up any capability at all. You've got to even start small. And, you know, for people who are thinking about moving job, moving career, what I say is take even, for example, like there's Coursera, there's Khan Academy, there's so many free tools out there and or inexpensive tools that you can go, what do I like? Because I know yeah. this job isn't working for me, but what could I add to my skill set to build new capability? before I go and leave the organization. So I don't have to go and jump and, you know, jump out of the plane without a parachute. I actually can go and I can try new things, dip my toe in the water elsewhere. And and the way the world is orchestrated today, it enables us to do that. So I think start small is really important and build those skills like you built with the call in show. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting too though, even with my voice like this, I'm like I'm not going to let that stop me from doing what I do. So last week, I was a panelist in a diversity, equity, and inclusion summit that had 1,100 um, listeners, participants. So after that, I'm like, I apologize for my voice, but I'm going to power through. I had a lady call me from Houston who 
arranges leadership and DEI workshops around the nation. And she said, I really want you to be a part of those. I want to bring you on as a speaker. And I thought, had I just said, no, nah, not going to do that. But I looked at it as an opportunity. I'm like, I've got 1,100 people that I can share, you know, my experiences with why it's important to embrace DEI. And so had I not done that, that opportunity would have never opened up. Deke, let's be honest here, man. I know why it really is. Do you, do you remember that show, Friends? Do you remember the American oh, TV show? Yeah. <laughs> do you remember Phoebe used to sing that song, Smelly Cat? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so there's an episode where she gets a cold. And she sings Smelly Cat and everybody loves it because she has her, her voice is sexier. Man. So that's, <laughs> that's what happened there. Let's be honest. Well, man, that's that's so funny you should say that <laughs> because one of the panelists said just that. They're like, man, you've got a cool raspy voice. I'm like, well, <laughs> if I got to go with that, that's what I'll go with. But that's you know, what your next, build your next capability as a country and Western singer, man. <laughs> Well, maybe the whiskey will help cure that. But Absolutely. I think it's a there's a great old saying that's attributed to Thomas Dewar from Dewar's whiskey, which you know I know is not a single malt, and so but people over there might not like it. But a mind is like a parachute; it works best when it's open. Oh, is that and who said that? I love that, that is story. that is who's yeah. credited with saying that. But but it's true. You know, life is about amazing experiences. I just did a um, national webinar last Sunday called The Wealthy Changemaker. So it was done by a 20-something-year-old girl. But I'm like, first off, I want to, you know, redefine wealth for you because wealth is not all about money. Wealth can be a wealth of life experiences. It can be a wealth of friends and family. And so I would just suggest to you, don't always define wealth as money. Because it's much, much more than that. That is such an important thing, Dick. I, I was thinking about that only recently. I was thinking about the, I'm doing this series on my own show, my own show um, a, a gentleman called Clayton Christensen, who passed away three years ago. He's the father of the term disruptive innovation. And yep. He co-authored 12 books with different people. And one of his best books he wrote after he'd gotten ill. So he'd had some severe illnesses like leukemia, he had uh, a, a severe heart attack, etc. And he wrote this book called How Will You Measure Your Life? Yeah. And that book actually changed my life. And what it does is it changes the lens through which you see the metrics that we measure things. And for example, it made me think, here I am working in this at the time I was working in a very I would say toxic organization, yeah. earn, earning good money. And my whole thing in my head was like, I'll earn, I'll earn this money to give my family the best opportunities. But in doing so, I rarely saw my family because I, yeah. I was working so much. And then when I was with them, I wasn't with them mentally. I, I was there physically. And I read this book and it changed how I looked at things and including the metrics by which I measured abundance. So I stopped measuring like, you know, big fancy car, um, stopped measuring, you know, fancy restaurants, the, the Armani suit, whatever you want to, whatever is abundance for you. And I started to look at now I have time to actually be with my kids, drop them to school um, be present with my wife and watch even some crappy show like the Kardashians. <laughs> but I'm there with her, you know, and and, uh, and yes, it's a huge sacrifice and it is. <laughs> but that, that's how I recalibrated and measured things differently. And it, it was it was, I, I count myself so lucky to do it before it was too late. And it was it was like you it was through writing my own book. And I was looking at that one of the things I talk about is the S curve, which is a uh, a mental model or a heuristic to m measure any wide range of phenomenon where it, it, if you if our audience thinks of if you're listening to us think of the letter s stretched out and, and this measures any kind of new product or service or life cycle and it starts off as this period of slow growth and then goes through rapid growth and then just like the bottom of the s with the slow growth it goes through a kind of a stagnancy phase a stagnant phase and then decline and through giving talks like you do and running workshops, I realized that 
I, I started to look at my life uh, as the S-curve and kind of go, wh- where am I neglecting things? And I realized my marriage, my my life, I was kind of going to myself, oh, that'll be there for me when I'm ready, when, yes. I, when I've made enough, when I have enough in the coffers. And then I realized that that's wrong because the very people you're hoping to build a life for will grow impatient with you and they may grow resentful and for me that was just never <clears throat> worth it you know it's it's interesting we i've started a monthly prayer breakfast here my first day in office in 2005 and 17 years later it's still going on it's very diverse with you know people of different faith traditions and everything but a gentleman who has been coming since it started got up and spoke today and it's just an interesting perspective He's 85 years old, and a year ago today, he had a major heart attack that almost killed him. So he's now on a walker, but tomorrow is he and his wife's 65th birthday. I mean, 65th anniversary. So he was saying that, you know, none of the things that he expected to happen in life happened in the past year, but he said it's actually been the best year of his life. And to hear somebody that, but he appreciated making it through the heart attack and being able to celebrate the 65th anniversary with his wife. So I just thought that was a very unique perspective. But I came home and I told my wife, I said, you know, for, for that event to be, go, I mean, monthly for 17 years, you know, it was a pretty, I mean, and somebody was saying it's the most diverse gathering that we have locally, I'm like, I'm so blessed to have been a small part of it. But that's kind of everything I do in my life is focused on diversity and bringing people together on common ground. And it's like with the the DEI workshop summit last week, I told my wife, I don't hold myself out to being a DEI professional. But for me, it's just really, let's treat each other with dignity and respect and fairly. I mean, that's that's what my parents taught me to do. So that's not necessarily saying I'm a professional on this issue, but it's just I love being inclusive and making people feel a part of something bigger than themselves. That's a lovely legacy, man. Talk about how, how will you measure your life? Those are the things that are really important, aren't they? Those when you hear back stories like that and it's something, as you said, you've you've created, that's the stuff that really matters when you're being measured and you're up at the gates i always often think of heaven <laughs> as the as the nightclub in the sky and there's a bouncer on the door say peter <laughs> and he's like going hey copenhauer you're good buddy come on in. <laughs> you got a vip pass and he's taking up the velvet rope and letting you in but um i was thinking about what you said there like your book's called the change maker and my own book is is about change transformational yeah. change and about the heart attack, there's a really interesting study that I cite in the book that when people and, and what I'm why I'm sharing this is m- most organizational transformation efforts fail. So yes. we the figure is 70 to 80 percent. I actually think Deke is higher and people because people don't want to be admitting that they yes. spent these billions of dollars in change initiatives and they didn't work. But I think the biggest problem is you cannot change business models till they change mental models. Which exactly. Is, again, you can't change how people do things until you change how they think about things. And one of the biggest problems is what you recognize is there is, is the lack of empathy for people's resistance to change. And one of the reasons I, I share all of this is you, you prompted me to do that with the heart attack story. There's a study where they took a cohort of people who had had severe heart attacks stents put in loads of different heart transplantations all kinds of stuff with their heart and they were told by their doctors look deke if you don't change your lifestyle buddy if you don't give up that bourbon or that irish whiskey (laughs) and you stop eating those big texan steaks you're gonna die and just for our audience guess how many people were capable of making the change when their own lives depended on it nine percent of people really make the changes nine percent and we wonder why 
so many transformation efforts fail because you can't change what people do until you change how they think. And most people who do change have reframed it and given themselves a different story, which is a real soft skill that's often neglected in organizational change. You know, it's, it's interesting, though, in speaking to um, Awadi Yaya, as he reached out to me after the, um, after the seminar, but she would, so part of the reason she wants me to come speak is because I'm a 55-year-old white male, so I'm like the hardest demographic to convince to embrace DEI initiatives. So she says, well, maybe you can speak to these people. But she said, why, why do you think that white males have a problem? I said, I think it's sort of socialization. If you've only been around like and it's been so politicized, I'm like, this is not a Democrat or Republican issue. You know, the, the, the Generation Z is the most diverse generation in history. And they want to work at diverse companies. And they want to live in diverse communities. So this isn't, you know, touchy-feely. This is good business sense. If you're a business or if you're in the political field and you can't access that generation to buy your product or to vote for your candidates, you're going to lose in the long run. But here again, DEI issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion are perceived to be a liberal issue, which it's not to me. It's just common sense. It's funny, I, I, when I'm telling people about um, DEI, I, I, I often think about this story. So this hilarious story that I share. So I, I worked for a gentleman who, had, who has a private jet. And one of the very nice things he does is if somebody in Ireland, a family he knows or he hears of has fallen upon hard times and maybe has a sickness, he'll fly them over to specialist doctors in the U.S., and in his language, he'll give them a lift over yes. to, over the pond, over, over <laughs> to you guys. And there was a story about a kid. So one of the kids that he, this kid had become ill, he was flying him over. And the kid had never, ever traveled on a plane before. So he went on the private jet. Thankfully, years later, he gets well. He's overcome his illness. And he goes on his first family holiday. And he boards the plane the very way he would board the private jet. And he climbs the stairs, gets to the top, turns around, bawling, crying. He's like, Mommy, Daddy, what are all these people doing on our plane? <laughs> right? and, and, and I share that story to go, that's not a bold child. That's the story of privilege. Yeah. And that's a huge problem with any kind of EDI or DEI, whatever you want to call it any kind of diversity issue is that oftentimes the people who are biased don't even know they're biased or yeah. privileged don't even know you're privileged because privilege and bias are, in the, are are invisible it's very hard to detect them and sometimes you think you're you're doing a good job and you're just oblivious one of the stats deke i heard was in the states in particular many many ceos have stay-at-home spouses yeah. And you, you, like on the surface, that, that's great. That, that is great. It's great for the children. We, we know those kind of things. But when they expect other people in the organization to act in a certain way, they're a little bit like that kid in the plane where the other people have to think about, okay, who's going to mind my kids if I go to that event? Who I have to get a babysitter because my spouse works. I, you know, might have to call upon my, my grant, my, my parents, you know, the grandparents to come in and help, I might not be able to afford the babysitter. There's loads and loads of things that from a position of privilege that you don't know. And that's the other thing about you mentioned the 55 year old white male. There's there's lots of well intended gentlemen. Oh, yeah, and women, but they are just oblivious to what's needed and what's required. Well, it's, it's interesting. I love grassroots engagement. That's where I get my energy. But one thing I see with, I mean, it's true in the corporate world and in the political world, when you have people in leadership positions that get very insular. So I, for, starts with us, this national nonprofit I'm on the board of, I went to our farmer's market and interviewed people for five hours. You know, I want to see more of in America, less, I want to see more unity, less division. But 
they said, why do politicians not understand this? And they pinned basically the extremism, the hyperpolarization in the U.S., which I'm sure every country is experiencing that, but on the media and on politicians. They said, well, why don't our politicians understand? I said, well, they're not out engaging at the grassroots level. So do they really understand, you know, what the will of the people is, which is to have leaders that bring us together. But you've got to, you know, as you say, I mean, a matter of privilege, if you don't understand that you're privileged because you're hanging around with other privileged people all the time, it's just uh, those silos are dangerous things. There's a, there's a great, you reminded me of this, Deke, that, I don't know if you've seen it, there's a great documentary on Woodstock 99, did you, did you see that documentary? I think I did, I think I did. Yeah. So, so essentially, they, the same guy who put Woodstock together tried to resurrect it in, in I think it was 99, and it turned it was, out to be it was. an absolute, absolute unmitigated disaster, it was, hor- the, the documentary's horrific, It's it's got there's just the most awful things happen. But one of the things I found really interesting, and like you, I'm I'm in the midst of writing again, I'm writing my second book. And I was using this to go, we often make decisions from the way we see the world, not often, we always do. And we, we very rarely have the empathy to understand how other people see the world. So the reason I share that is in that Woodstock documentary, it shows that the organizers had this kind of VIP section to the to the experience, to the Woodstock experience. And then everybody else was outside and they had skimped on. So it was it became a money making scene versus the original Woodstock, which yes. had actually a, a real purpose. This was all about making money and they didn't clean out the toilets, lo- loads of issues. And as a result, the concert goers who were paying top dollar for their tickets, they were being held captive to really high prices. So bottles of water were like $10. There was no clean water. The toilets weren't being cleaned, etc. But there was, a, there was a meeting. And some people who were these hired security guards who were actually college kids paid really, really low money in order to be security for the event to keep prices down started to report to upper management that we have a problem here. And of course, the upper management, the leadership, from their perspective, they're kind of going, what's the problem? This look, everything's going absolutely fine because of that distance between their pearly gates and their kind of ivory towers versus what it was really like in the field, literally in the field. Yeah. And I, I, I thought to myself, that's exactly what happens in organizations. There's a gap between the leadership team and so oftentimes when they make strategy and actually what's going out and uh, on out in the field and the great former CEO of Intel Andy Grove said the snow always melts at the edges first so the edges of the organization the edges of society start to inform what it's really like out there and that goes to exactly your point about people neglecting the grassroots because the grassroots is the funky fringes where things started to change and then that feeds into the center and then it starts to proliferate. And if you're not listening to those edges, you're in trouble. Well, it's, so I've quoted this often on the show, but in 2024 here in the US, millennials and Gen Z will comprise 45% of the electorate. And so here again, you know, that's not, I'm not being subjective, I mean, that, that's just uh, real, you know? So here again, if you can't engage that generation and I share with them, I'm like, you have significant power. You know, you guys can really change the world. And that's one of my fashions is to mentor that generation because I understand them. I was 37 years old when I first ran for mayor and I was told not to run. I hadn't paid my dues. I'm like, I've been where you guys are, but you just, you have the potential to have a huge impact on the world and I want to help you do it. And by them actually being involved, Deke, I think is, a, is another thing is when you involve people in the change, they feel like they own it. So they're going to be more committed to it. And it, I mean, this is again, 
I mean, it doesn't when you say it doesn't sound like it's revolutionary, but unfortunately, very few organizations, which is where I yield my my work, I suppose, if you want to put it that way, neglect that they don't include their people in the strategy. Yeah, going back to what we said about Woodstock, for example, is that that divide between the leadership team who make the strategy and the people then who are expected to execute the strategy that goes exactly for an electorate as well like yeah. you've got to include them and by including them and they feel that they actually have a voice instead of these decisions being made in the vacuum then they're going to be buy in more to a party and to a group etc and actually then go and do something about it and feel like they are actually in charge which they should be well, I've often said that I've sat through so many board meetings where people and used to be millennials, now it's Gen Z. How do we engage the next generation? And I'm like, there's nobody under the age of 40 sitting in this room. That would be like a bunch of wealthy white guys sitting around saying, how do we address racial reconciliation? You know, you've got to have, I mean, every generation deserves a seat at the table in my, in my book because times change, but their opinions are valuable and they should be included in the decision-making process. Absolutely, man. I, I had to, I, I'm going to share this and it will, it just shows you, right, even when you're well-intended, like, so I'd be well-intended with my DEI efforts. I, I'm a huge believer and supporter of neurodiversity. So it's one of the yep. things I try to bring into the organizations I work in. Just a co you mentioned some of the benefits, so it's good for business. But one of the things I really found w was incredible in one of the pieces of research I read is that when the when the group of people you are meeting with, say for example, it's a leadership team or it's a strategic team for for a project, when that's a diverse group, and it's not all just a boys' club, which which is comfortable for the boys. Let's yeah. be honest; it's comfortable to to know all those guys. When the, t when the team is diverse, people prepare better for it. They do their work beforehand. They don't miss the meetings. <laughs> they don't come in stinking of maybe the Irish whiskey we mentioned <laughs> earlier on after having a hard one the night before. They don't do those things. So as a result, your team actually behaves more professionally because they don't want to look like they're lacking or have a gap in their knowledge for the meeting. Instead of... Oftentimes people don't even look at the agenda or there is no agenda and they show up to the meeting. And I thought that was really, really fascinating about actually prepping a team. So to make the diverse team actually makes the team better team. And, you know, I was thinking about what you were saying as well about including the, the lower groups. I was I, I had this brilliant lady on the on my own show, a lady called Terry Givens, and she wrote this amazing book called Radical Empathy. And I was interviewing her, Deke, and I had this experience of absolute privilege on my behalf, oblivious to what the lady was talking about. So she goes, she's two children, I have two children, two boys. And she goes, oh, yeah, you know, you know, that chat that you eventually have to have. And, and in my head, I'm like, oh, the birds and the bees. Like, that's what <laughs> came to my head, right? So I'm going to go, oh, yeah, dreaded that chat. And she goes, what, what chat are you talking about? I was like, oh, the birds and the bees. And she's like, going, no, no. I'm talking about the fact when you have two young African-American male boys that they can't play cops and robbers or cowboys and Indians in the driveway out the front garden because they run the risk of being shot by the police. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. That is privilege on my behalf. I was oblivious to what she was talking about. And that's the challenge. Yeah. So after the George Floyd incident, I participated in a sort of a community workshop podcast. But one of the things I shared was, so I said, I've never been racially profiled, but I have a lot of bright friends who have been. So I can't say what that feels like, but I can ask them. And so I had a film crew filming me for this, and a young man who uh, was the producer, African-American, he said, you know, I'm so glad you said that. He said, recently my son, my you know, young son and I were traveling to Atlanta. We had borrowed a friend's car, and we got pulled over. So it's two hours 
the interstate between here and Atlanta. He said, my son started crying uncontrollably because he was afraid that, you know, the police were going to hurt his father. So that's an experience that I've never had, but that happened for a reason. That wasn't like he just produced that just so he could tell somebody. I mean, that's actual fear in the young child, you know, based on potentially what they've seen in the news, but that's just real. And that's something that's the empathy piece is key because here again, I can't understand what that feels like, but I should be able to talk and have empathy for people that have gone through that. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, traveling with a small child and getting pulled over and them just, you know, bawling, crying because they're terrified. I know. And, and that's the thing is, now, I mean, it goes back to the kid boarding the plane. We, yeah. we have no idea of, and, and, you know, that's just one kind of di- group of people. And then there's all different types of groups. And, you know, I often think as well, right, so it's like, it's like a patchwork. The world's made up like a, of a patchwork quilt. Like, so there's different types of intelligence. So the education system needs to cater for all those different types of learning. Then there's the different upbringings people have, different content that they receive. Like, so we're all unique. We're all oh, yeah. as unique as lo- snowflakes. And it's difficult to cater for, for the differences in people. But when you have empathy, and as that lady Terry talked about, when you have radical empathy, you start to kind of go, hmm, I wonder what it could be like for the other person. And that's the start of it. That's the start of the change. You know, it's interesting, though, in starting to write this new book, I'm, I'm researching bridging initiatives and individuals and organizations worldwide. And there are so many organizations doing amazing work out there. But you just don't see them in the mainstream media. So it's we that starts with us. We released a report in conjunction with George Washington University several weeks ago that showed that during the lead up to the midterm elections here in the States, that the hyper partisan politicians on both sides, Democrats and Republicans, got four times more coverage than those in Congress working on bipartisan issues. So th- there are people in Congress here working in bipartisan fashion, but they get no spotlight. And so even being in Ireland, you may have heard of our Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. She's a little bit of a lightning rod. She gets more coverage than anybody else in Congress. So it's just, it's crazy. It's the perception of the world because I think we want to come together. We want to live as communities. We in general want to you know, love our neighbors and be good to each other and kind. But that's just not necessarily what we're dictated with and what we see. Absolutely, man. And, and you, you know, you raised the point of like the news is essentially that term. If it bleeds, it leads. Yeah. It, so the, there's this negativity bias in the news leads. So it, it gets it gets bigger viewership and that goes back to the metrics because the metrics are dictating that you know we need bigger viewers to get bigger advertising it's a melting platform a melting iceberg anyway because of the fragmentation in the media world and and you can see how all these things start to intertwine and therefore me covering a good news story about diversity and equality in an organization isn't going to be a a hit piece of content and to your point like one of the most effective things in any kind of DEI is just exposure, exposure to the stories of others. And that's what I loved about your that group of diverse people you brought together. The listening to other people's stories. I mean, you get this with your podcast, and I'm sure with your talk show that you had before, was that listening to other people's side of the story gives you empathy. Because you, yes. like, you have so many of these moments where you're like, ah, oh, I never thought of it that way before. Yeah, of course you didn't, because you're a human being. And if you're human, you're biased. And that's not a negative thing. That's just the way we are, because we have limited cognitive capacity. And I think the more stories we share, and the more we see that there are people out there like us trying to make a change, then the better the world will be. I'd completely agree. And it's so, it's so easy 
to paint with a broad brush. And I share with people, so James Brown was from Augusta, was a good friend of mine. But what people, most people don't know, and I wrote about it in my book, James Brown was a conservative Republican who endorsed Richard Nixon in 1972. And so, so many local people were like, I didn't realize James Brown was a Republican, but we make the assumption he's black and he's in the entertainment industry. So naturally, he has to be a Democrat and be liberal. But I think it's just looking at the world in a nuanced way. And I think people want to be a part of these good conversations. It's why people listen to you and it's why they listen to this show as well. And James Brown, man. <laughs> and by the way, he actually, in a funny coincidence, serendipity, he, he actually opened the Woodstock 99 conf- uh, uh, event as well, the, the concert. Did he really? Yeah, yeah. He came back from retirement to open. That is hilarious. And they tried to screw him over, actually, and trying to pay him less or something like that during the con- like, I mean, it It's worth watching, Deke. I mean, if you look at it through the lens of that privilege from the from the leadership of the conference yeah. it's actually very very interesting that that's that's how i absorbed it now i didn't i'm not that much of a nerd that I sat <laughs> down and, i'm gonna look at this from a diversity <laughs> element but it just it occurred to me as i watched it and i found it very interesting well that's awesome well man i would we'll start to wrap it up now but what you know You've got to love speaking to students at Trinity. And I was just going to say, if you have a chance for me to get in front of any of those students while I'm there, I would love to do that because that's another just getting the energy of those young generations makes me very excited for the future. Oh, man, I, I love doing it. I, you know, I, I start off doing it. And, and I want to say this because when people hear stories of people who've made a change you know i i have a i'm very much a gig economy worker i have a few different realms in which i work i do workshops and keynotes and then i do the lecturing i'm a board director etc and what i find interesting about the students is i started to do that years before i went and worked for myself so i was working in organizations and i took on this and it was it was difficult because you had to try and manage it as well as everything else. But it's it's one of the things I wouldn't let go of, even though it's probably the most difficult. I So I do what I do is I do run a couple of modules or develop the modules and deliver them. But I learn so much from actually doing it from the students, yep. from their reactions, from their questions. And then most importantly from their essays so when they have assignments they i asked them to write it in a very different way but i actually created a module called transformation for individuals and organizations and what i'm really really trying to do is make sure that they're writing their own script for their lives yeah and and that they're not following a script that exists in society and this whole they, what they expect of me, yeah. or my parents, you know, sometimes they feel, oh, I got to be a lawyer or whatever, because my parents want that for me. And you're kind of going, but what do you want? And and that's yeah. one of the things I try to do in there is go, the world has changed dramatically. And oftentimes those ladders that you start to climb, you will have realized they're against the wrong wall. So if you're going to climb a ladder, make sure it's against the right wall. And sometimes yep. it won't work out just like the assets and the ashes. But realize what you've learned from the experience and stretch yourself a little bit go a little bit outside your comfort zone because when you're outside that comfort zone that's where the learning happens well Aiden man you've been an absolutely awesome guest but where can our viewers and listeners find you the best place is either on LinkedIn so Aiden McCullough at LinkedIn and then the innovation show dot io and the reason I chose .io is because it it stands for input output, and just like you, the way I the way I kind of conduct the show is I read the guest's book before the guest shows up, interview them about it, and then have some type of output from that conversation. But then I also write about it and loosely connected to the show some inspiration that I would have had from the conversation. So that's why it's input output. So the innovation show .io. Well, I look forward to the Home and Home series. But my last question, what puts a smile on your face 
and brings joy to your heart on a daily basis? I think knowing that you've made some difference in some way, like just like your instance with their with the gentleman and the diverse group, knowing that getting an email from a listener to say that show that episode really helped me I felt, you know, somewhat isolated, and that really helped me or whether it's like, with my children. So when my my younger son started to play soccer, and when he comes back to me, he goes, Oh, that thing you taught me, I did it in the <laughs> in the in the training or in the game. And those things are, are the really important stuff. Well, man, I will tell you, I very much look forward to our visit in Ireland. And we will have a little whiskey too, if that's cool with you. <laughs> but thank you for being an amazing guest, Aiden. An absolute pleasure, Deke. Look forward to meeting you in person. Sounds great. That's all we've got. Dropping the mic and we are out. Hey guys, thanks for listening to or watching the Changemaker podcast today. Greatly appreciate it. If you're listening and you want to see the video, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel at Deke Copenhaver. That's a pretty, pretty easy to remember, I would think. But really, we also want to remind you to like, subscribe, rate, across all platforms, download. And if you're looking for a coach, a speaker, or anything, you know where to find me. Just email me at me at deekcopenhaver.com. And thanks so much for listening.